Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral. I'm Pastor Stefan. And I'm Cassandra. And we are so happy that you decided to join us for online church this morning. We hope that this message blesses you. Please share this video, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love you, and we will see you soon. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I can see you smiling. Because eyes are the window to the soul. And I can see you smiling this morning. You glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Bless the Lord. Before I pray and we go into the word, let me say a couple of things. Number one, uh, you may have been hand handed a paintbrush. I hope you've made the connection between the paintbrush and the message. It's to remind you that whether male or female, we're painting a portrait of the kind of picture we want left when each of us stands before the Lord someday. And our loved ones look back on our lives and that's what they see. The second thing I wanna say is thank you all so much, those watching by the live stream, those of you in this sanctuary, for how you blessed me and blessed my family for Father's Day. I want you to know I don't take those things lightly. And those gifts and the cards are so much touching our hearts and our lives. Thank you for remembering us. Father, now indeed we come before the throne of grace. That is the place that you tell us to come when we need help. And Lord, every time I stand in this pulpit, I am reminded again and again how much I need your help. For Lord, if you don't help me, first of all, I fall into that false security of thinking that it's me who does the, 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 the touching and the changing of hearts and lives. I'm reminded today that I'm simply the conduit. I'm reminded today that I need your help because also, if you don't anoint my words, they're simply words. I've not come today to give a good speech. I've not come today to just say something to say that something was said. But I've come believing within my heart and my soul that I am a bearer of the word that you have birthed in my spirit. And though it's my voice, it is your voice speaking through my voice. And therefore, the hearers cannot escape the voice of God. And because of that, we're going to be changed this day. Moved from glory to glory to glory. And every man, woman, boy, and girl, under the sound of my voice, if you believe that this day, say amen and give God glory. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I love this story. An elderly man in Phoenix phoned his son in New York and he said, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you, your mother and I are divorcing. 43 years of misery is enough. The son screamed, Pop, what are you talking about? The old man replied, we can't stand the sight of each other any longer. We are sick of each other, and I'm sick of all of this, so you can call your sister in Chicago and tell her too. Then the old man hung up, frantic. The son called the sister who exploded over the phone. She shouted like, heck, they're getting divorced. I'll take care of this. She calls Phoenix, screams in the phone at the old man. You are not getting a divorce. Don't you do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back and we'll be there tomorrow. She said, until then, don't you do a thing. Do you hear me? She hung up the phone. The old man hung up on his end, turned to his wife and said, okay, they're coming for Thanksgiving and they're paying their fares. Now, what shall we tell them for Christmas? I want to continue talking about this message about the portrait of a godly man. In Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah that I formed you in your mother's womb before you even knew you were in there. And I want to say to men in this room, because I want to finish this Father's Day message, telling you that when you were in your mother's womb, God formed you. You look exactly the way that God intended for you to look. You have the voice that God intended you to have and all of the gifts and the attributes that God intended you to have. Everything about you is exactly as God designed and desired you to be. And then when he breathed his life into you, he gave you what is known as a lifetime. And for every one of us, the length of that lifetime is different. But in that lifetime, he gave you life. He breathed his breath into you. And that life became the canvas upon which you paint the portrait that will inhabit the frame. 
And we learned last week that the value of the frame is pretty much meaningless until you place within that frame the portrait that is, is of meaning to you on the inside of that. And the reason that we get personal portraits painted is because we want people to remember the way we were once we exit this people planet. And they're, they're there to remind us of what kind of person we were after we are gone. And that portrait is a reminder of a legacy that you leave behind. And my prayer is that the goal of every man of God is to leave a godly legacy behind. And so we began painting the portrait of a godly man. Number one, we said the godly man must refuse to hide behind his past. Secondly, the godly man must reposition himself. And the third thing that we learned is that the godly man must learn to function in four realms of dominion. The first one is this, the godly man rules and reigns over his spirit. Second, the godly man rules and reigns as a priest. Third, the godly man rules and reigns as a prophet. And the fourth thing we began to learn is that the godly man rules and reigns as kings. Now, I want to take this a little bit farther and a little bit deeper, but I want to here and there speak specifically to young single men, and I want to speak to you because, again, if I can help you on the front end, you'll have less struggle once you get into a relationship. I want to say that single men in this room learn to love yourself first. Because if you don't, you will get somebody in your life and you will cause them all kinds of, mis of misery because you're attaching yourself to someone because you're trying to be affirmed when what you really need to know is who you are. And it it it's interesting to me because when you know who you are, then you marry because you have found a wife and not a substitute mother. Let that just soak in just for a minute. Now let's go deeper into what it means for a godly man to rule and to reign as king. 1 Corinthians 11 and 6 says this, For if a woman is not covered, let her be shorn, but if she is, it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God. But woman is the glory of man, for man is not for woman, but woman for the man. Nor was man created for woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, woman, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Because of the angels. Now stop right there and think about what that just said it says that even as mighty as angels are they are submitted to somebody and that being almighty God now stay with me because I want to show you something in this scripture about this scripture it has been misused and abused and misunderstood probably more than any other word of God when it comes to female male relationships in years gone by and in some circles unto this day, 1 Corinthians 11 and 6 was used to keep women from cutting their hair, from wearing makeup, from wearing pants, along with a host of other scriptures to keep women in physical and emotional bondage. Stay with me now. What ladies, what you have got to understand is that you can't handle a man, but God can. That's why there is the reference of angels being submitted in this verse. Now watch. A woman, when she takes, marries a man, she takes that man's last name. What does it mean? It means covering. When a woman takes your name, man, it means a covering, and it is to be added value, not backwards. They're giving up the covering of their father in order to receive your covering. Let me illustrate it this way. Dolce & Cabana or Gucci jeans are more expensive because of the name, added value. They could be made in the same factory, they could be made on the same manufacturing floor by the same people, but they wrote Dolce & Cabana or Gucci on them, put them in the store. The regular jeans are $29.99, but because Dolce & Cabana or Gucci is on that pair of pants, those are now $79.99. What do you go after? You go after the brand name. Why? Value added. Listen to me very closely. Because I've told women in this church, and I repeat it, I tell ladies all the time, don't hook up with a brother who does not add value to you. They might have J.C. Penney value when you're already at Saks or Nordstrom value. Stay with me for a moment. And ladies, I want you to hear the Holy Spirit. Learn to do more than read the labels. Why don't you check out the material too? Because somebody can stick a label on anything and call it that. Let me illustrate it this way. 
I have a suit hanging in my closet that is now much too big for me. I paid $68 for it. I didn't know the label. I didn't know the material. It was made in Italy. I took it to my Italian tailor. He felt it. He said, can I keep this suit for two weeks? Do you understand that this material, this suit that you paid $68 for, it is worth $3,200? I want to show it to all my Italian friends. You know what I'm trying to tell you? I had to do more than just pay attention to the label. I had to feel the material. And ladies, listen to me. You need to look at a man and not just look at the label the way he looks on the outside. And you need to check out the material. You need somebody who enhances you. Not money. I'm talking about covering the whole system. Now watch what God says to men. He says, I'm responsible to keep you straight. You're responsible to cover her and the children. Listen now. And God says, as I give to you, you are to provide for them. Verse 11, neither is the man independent of the woman, married or single. We are responsible men to raise our children. Listen, far too many of us miss this, and we wonder why our young people are confused about everything from sexuality to even believing if God is real. We are responsible to make sure they don't just get good grades, but the wisdom of God. Let me just step out somewhere where we many times don't step. Parents, today we are more concerned about our kids, uh, our, our public secular education than we are about their spiritual education. We will make sure they are involved in everything at school. We will sacrifice. We will pay for it. But the minute that Pastor Stefan says we got a youth activity, oh, that's too much money. Let me talk to you for a minute. And the worst thing that parents can do when your kids are in trouble is to ground them from youth group or children's church because we are responsible to make sure that they don't just good, get good grades, but that the wisdom of God invades their minds. Because my parents put wisdom in me. When I started dating, I knew when to go home. Oh, no, let's go somewhere. I never stayed in a girl's home after a certain time. My parents said, 12 midnight. My daddy said, if you don't come home at 12 midnight, there's a comfortable spot for you on the porch. Something that they said, men, it grabbed me on the inside and it said, a man of God doesn't do that. Things they put in me, they grabbed my spirit and said, that's not who you are. It doesn't matter what the world is saying. It doesn't matter what the world is doing. It doesn't matter if everybody is saying, do it. You don't do it because as for me in my house. And married and single, we need each other. Yet men are to rise up and to become covering. That means when a single man, listen to me, when you're pursuing a woman, you are to cover her from the start to the finish. You are to make sure that they stay sexually pure. Men, that's our job. Listen to me. If she gets pregnant, don't you come to me and say she got pregnant. Listen to me. That was not immaculate conception. You are under immaculate deception. You failed to cover her. Oh, it's quiet in here now. And Adam walked with God. And God instructed so Adam could teach it. God didn't put him to sleep until he fully instructed him in the word. And he told him, now that I've taught you, it's your responsibility to teach what I've taught you to your wife and your children. It is not the woman's responsibility. Now notice what God didn't say. He didn't say that women weren't capable. He said it's not their responsibility. Let me tie this into being a king in your home. Sarah called Abraham Lord. Not to pump up his ego, but because he was her covering. Men and women, listen to me. We are equal in essence, but not in function. And hence, why we have so many dysfunctional families and people who really love God, but they're all jacked up because we don't understand that we are out of order. We don't understand that the husband and the wife, yes, in the eyes of God, we are equal in essence, but not in function. Let me illustrate it this way. There was a research done by the Christian Business Committee's Men's Committee, and this is what they found. When a father is active, not just coming to church once in a while, and then when he comes to church sitting there like a bump on a log, but when he is active, 
there is about a 75% likelihood that the children will become active believers, but if only the mother is a believer, the likelihood is dramatically reduced by 15%. 1 Peter 3 and 1, men love this. Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your, hus your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. But you need to read verse 7 because it's the most important, men. Likewise, you husbands, do well with them in understanding. Give an honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel as being heirs together in the grace of life that our prayers may not be hindered. Now stop there just for a moment and follow this with me. Men, when we are out of position, we can't pray. Now you can open up your mouth but God's not listening. Seminars on prayer will not help you. If you're single in this church and you're out dogging out women on Saturday night and coming in here and weeping like a little puppy dog on Sunday morning, it doesn't matter. God's not hearing you. Let me talk to you for a minute. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So many times I hear men of God saying, My wife's not this, my wife's not that, when the truth is mainly it's because we have not done what we're supposed to do. Stay with me now. Don't shut me down. This is vital. Every husband and father, in essence, is a pastor. Your congregation is called your family. Adam and Eve... Eve took first, but listen to me now. When trouble came, God did not go to Eve. He went to the one who he had given the responsibility to. Here's a question. What was Adam doing that Satan had liberty to speak into Eve's ear? I'll tell you what he was not doing. He was not covering. For had he been there, he could have rebuked the devil off of the situation. Let me say it again. Everything is not our fault, men, but it's our responsibility. Men of God, listen to me. Single men, learn to be more than saved. There is a father absence in America epidemic. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 19.7 million children, more than one in four, live without a father in the home. And there are people who think that this is no big deal, that it's not an important element of our society today, that there is no male and no influence of a man in the home. One more time, church, let this burrow into your spirit. The biblical family, the one with a mother and a father. Mother, father. It was not a good idea, it was a God idea. And we are suffering because once again, we have thought that it's okay to redefine what God already defined without suffering the consequences. Listen to the effects of the father's being absent in the home. Watch this now. There was a study done by Dr. Gerard Brown. Before I take you through some of it, he says this. The children in single-parent households experience more physical and psychological problems compared to those raised in two-parent households. Now, everybody, just hold on. Don't make up your mind right now. I'm shutting that out. Stay focused here. He talks about the adverse outcomes. Adverse outcome number one, perceived abandonment. Adverse outcome number two, Attachment issues. Adverse outcome three, child abuse. Adverse outcome four, child obesity. Adverse outcome five, criminal justice involvement. Adverse outcome six, gang involvement. Adverse outcome seven, mental health issues. Adverse outcome eight, poor school performance. Adverse outcome nine, poverty and homelessness. Adverse outcome 10, substance abuse. Now hold on, because this is why I told you don't shut me out. Listen to the conclusion Dr. Brown comes to. Given the large research base suggesting that children who grow up in homes without a father present, adverse outcomes at rates significantly above those with fathers present, that means that attention to this phenomenon is perhaps warranted by clinicians, researchers, and policymakers. It is important, though, to point out that not all children who are raised in a father-absent home will experience adverse outcomes. Listen now. With this said, available evidence cannot be ignored. Let me say something that a whole lot of people probably won't like. 
But we are living in a day and age where the color of the skin doesn't matter when it comes to this thing of men making babies without being daddies to them. And what I'm about to say is going to make some of us mad, but that's all right. That's my gift. I have the gift of being an equal opportunity offender. Watch this now, because I want to talk to my black brothers for a moment. And I don't care if you're American black, Haitian black, Puerto Rican black, Brazilian black, black is black, and that's all that black is. Racism is real, it is demonic, it's abhorrent, it's disgusting, spiritual evil in this country. And what we fail to see is that God has been trying to kill that spirit since the beginning of the fall of man. And the church of Jesus Christ has not only tolerated and perpetuated, the church gave power to it for so-called Christians use the Bible to support their position. Now, this is more complicated than I'm going to make it, but I want to make a simple statement. Somebody somewhere took the word of God and they used it and they said that evil hides in the dark. So light is good, dark is bad, and therefore light skin is good and dark skin is bad. And racism took wings. And because whenever the word of God is used to belie a position, even if it's twisted, you need to understand that it will always soar because somebody used the word of God to back up their twisted mentality. And racism is indeed steep in the system of society and government, but also in many churches. We need to deal with it. Without and within the walls of the church. And with that said, now hold on, because this is the part where somebody's going to get mad, but that's all right. Here's the part you need to understand. With all of that said, everything is not the white man's fault. It is not just white police officers shooting our young black men. Our young black men are killing each other. And I heard one black pastor say this. He said, every street in every city in America named after Dr. Martin Luther King, every last one of them are filled with violence. Our young black men are killing each other. And I said that to say this. It does not mean that we should not deal with our police force. But what I'm trying to tell us is we black men, and particularly spiritual fathers, we have got to start behaving responsibly, responsibly and taking care of our babies that we bring into this world and becoming fathers and dads to them listen to me the proof slaps us in the face the greatest challenge of young black children and particularly young black men face today is trying to navigate the cesspool of a world with a system that is already stacked against them at birth without the blessing and the help of a father a daddy to guide them through the challenge Time for us black men to take responsibility for what we can control and stop allowing racism to stop us, to excuse us. See, it can hinder you, but it can't stop you unless you let it. And don't try and shoot me down because I'm black. I've been through my fire of racism. So don't, don't look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me go back to, black, to the Bishop Jake's book, Reposition Yourself. He said, when our nation's economy took a downturn in 2002 after 9-11, blacks proceeded to spend $22.9 billion on clothes, over $11 billion on furniture, over $3 billion on electronic appliances and toys. We spent almost $47 billion on cars in 2005, so much so that some automakers such as Lincoln have targeted us as a niche market. And young men today are more concerned about the bling bling hanging around their neck and how many gold teeth are in their mouths rather than taking care and being a daddy to the children that they father. And too many times we blame it on how hard it is to get ahead in the racist world when we must acknowledge and deal with racism without using it as an excuse to be an excuse. See, when I use racism as an excuse to be an excuse, then I insult Dr. King. I insult my forebearers. Listen to what Bishop Jake says. If you are black, you must realize that despite the seeming unfairness of your life circumstances, you have freedom for which your ancestors labored and died trying to provide. Their enslavement provided the human capital to build this country's wealth during the agricultural age. 
They were robbed of the benefits of their labor, pouring out their life's blood for the bloated wealth of white property owners. It's an understatement to say that this is unfair. Listen now. But still, our forebearers pressed on despite the injustice and despite the apparent futility of their efforts to effect change. To be sure, life itself is not fair. No matter who you are or what circumstances you may find yourself in, it is guaranteed that some aspects of your life will seem to limit you. Watch what he says next. Male or female, young, old, black or white, each one of us is, has to learn at an early age that life doesn't necessarily conform to our wishes. Listen to me. Church life is hard, no matter the color of your skin but especially for people of color. But the question that we've got to answer in this house today is the answer to the question, are we going to grow up and paint the portrait of a godly man with our lives or are we going to put a picture in a $5 frame with a $5 picture that says that our life never mattered? You've got to rule and reign, man of God, over your spirit as a priest, as a prophet, and as a king. Number four, the godly man must be in constant radical, radical pursuit of God. The godly man must be in constant radical pursuit of God. A man listened out the window as his son was playing with his buddies in the backyard. He overheard them talking about something that was very important, and this was what was said. One of them remarked, my dad knows the mayor of our town. Another said, that's nothing. My dad knows the governor of our state. Wondering what was coming next in the program of bragging, he heard his own little four-year-old son say, that's nothing. My dad knows God. Oh, God help us. Listen to me, church. That man, when he heard those words, he ran into a back room. He fell on his knees with tears streaming down his face. And he looked up to God and he prayed, Oh God, I pray that my boy will always be able to say, My dad knows God. Let me tell you something, men of God. That is the highest compliment a father can receive from his children. All the days of my life, I have never wanted Jessica and Shauna to be more proud of me because of the things hanging on my wall, because of my accolades and my degrees. Listen to me. I I have met some of the most famous and greatest people in the world, but the thing I am most proud of and hopeful for, I believe that if you ask Jessica and Shauna in private, they would say to you that our dad knows God. I want my daughters to say above all else that our dad is a man of faith. When it comes in the distant future for me to pillow my head in the lap of Jesus, I don't want my daughters to talk about my accomplishments. I want them to say our dad is now with the God who he knew intimately. You see, if you come in my office, the most valuable thing I have hanging on my wall is when the state of Pennsylvania gave out the Father of the Year Award for the first time, they gave it to me. I was so humble, so humble. Let me tell you what I know, men of God. There is a price to pay for being a godly man. And if you're going month after month and year after year and there is no negative repercussions that ever come your way because of your faith, then your faith has not been clearly demonstrated. You are a secret Christian, a spiritual CIA member. You are a covert operative because there have been no repercussions for your faith. Let me put it another way. If today you were accused of being a Christian, man of God, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would you be found innocent of all charges? Let me just drive this thing a little bit deeper with more emphasis on this man of God. Now, I, I, I still, I, 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 there is something about Christmas that I find interesting. Now, now stay with me for a moment. Now that I'm used to it, I like it, don't stop doing it. It's called wrapping gifts. But when I was a little boy, sometimes we didn't have enough money to wrap the gifts that we got. And so there was no wrapping paper, and my parents would wrap our gifts in newspaper. 
And I didn't understand why it was started, and I certainly don't understand why some people go in the mall and pay other folks to wrap your gifts. Listen to me, trust me on this. The person you're wrapping the gift for is not interested in your wrapping. Now, they may placate you by noticing the wrapping and telling you how pretty the bow looks. And believe me when I tell you this, but when it comes time to unwrap that bad boy, there will be no grace about it. They will rip it to shreds. And the wrapping paper and all the accompanying accessories are a camouflage that disguises what people are really interested in. Watch what I'm about to say. We all get hyped and geeks when we see people wrapped well. They drive a well-wrapped car. They live in a well-wrapped neighborhood. They work at a well-wrapped job. They wear well-wrapped clothes, and they have well-wrapped money. But listen to me, man of God. I may have described you, but God wants to know what the wrapping paper is covering. He is interested in knowing on what's the in, on the inside of you, not what you look like on the outside. See, if my wife wraps me a gift, I want you to understand something. I'm looking for something exciting. And I love Cane's donuts, but please don't wrap donuts for me on Christmas. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There was a man who passed away. And the preacher was up there, and he was, he was waxing eloquent, and he was, I mean, this dude was on a roll. He was describing how wonderful this man was. And finally, the deceased man's wife couldn't stay, take it anymore. She leaned over to her son and whispered, I want you to be discreet, but sneak up there and see if that's really your father in that box. She knew him. 2 Timothy 2.26 and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. If there was ever a day that our children needed to see God in us men, today is that day. Job 1 and 6, there was a day. Listen to me, men, women. Listen to me, boys and girls. Age means nothing. We stroll into funerals and we sit down and we act like our turn will never come. Let me tell you something that's true for all of us. There will be a day, should Jesus tarry, you won't be strolling and you'll be getting rolled in. And then the question is, have you and I painted the portrait of a godly man that they will remember on that day? Here's my last point. The godly man must overcome cultural, cultural influences. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and perfect will of God. Listen to me very closely, men of God. There have been cultural pressures being subtly applied. Some of them are good, but they have been presented to you in a way from the enemy that keeps you from presenting your life totally and completely sacrificed unto the Lord. Let me talk about very quickly about four types of cultural influences. Number one, the cultural influence of education. One of the things that has happened over the years in human history is that we have become more and more secularized. For centuries, there was a foundation of understanding of faith in God. The church had influence over the morals and the character and the knowledge of people. But in the past centuries and decades, we have become more and more secularized to the point that in America today, where more people think that they are a product of evolution or an accident of nature or simply part of the universe. Listen to me now. To the point where many no longer believe that we are a creation of God. Listen now. Let me show you how messed up mankind is. And I'm going to go deeper into this next Sunday in a new series but we are so culturally messed up that six out of 10 Americans reject the belief that human life is sacred, that human life is valuable because we are created in the image and the likeness of God. What happened to us? Here's what happened. Science has brought us many wonderful things, and we would never, ever deny the advantages that science has brought us. But it has also brought us to the hearts and the minds of people some things that have been very tragic. 
In the process, there came a term which I'll go deeper into next week. It is called the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment said this. It said basically man is good. And if we can educate all of mankind, they will be good and the earth will be good. So here's what we did. We kicked prayer out of the school and we have come to the Age of Enlightenment. And listen to me. And here's what I want you to know, man of God. We have gotten so enlightened, listen to me, that we have become so enlightened that we have almost destroyed ourselves. Because the problem that is plaguing us is that this way of thinking puts us rather than God in charge of our destiny. And here's the issue and why the man of God must overcome the culture of education if you want to paint a portrait of a godly man. With this mentality, we come into God's kingdom subconsciously, never fully surrendering to the Holy Spirit because it has been embedded in us subconsciously into our spirit somehow that even when it comes to living for God, it is really ultimately us that makes it happen. That if I'm going to truly be a Christian, it's up to me. And so we struggle and we never completely wield and yield our hearts to God because we never come to the true realization that Zechariah 4 and 6 is right. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And if you're going to paint the portrait of a godly man on the canvas of your life, you have got to overcome the cultural influences of education, number two, the cultural influence of family. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Some of you grew up in families that wanted nothing to do with God, and even to this day, they're telling you you're just going through a fad. They keep trying to pull you out. Others of you grew up in a family where there was no father in the home, or if he was, he was invisible as far as his relationship with you. Or you saw a culture of violence and destruction or alcohol and addictions that ran amok. Whatever it is, if you want to be a father, a man after God's own heart, you want to paint a portrait of a godly man, listen to me, you've got to get rid of that cycle of cultural influence off of your life that keeps you from being all that God wants you to be. Number three, the cultural influence of society. Matthew 6, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is evil, that is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. How great is the darkness. Here's what I want you to see, man of God. We live in a society where so many see the limitations rather than the possibilities. Jesus is not talking about the physical eye here because your physical eye does not let light into your body. He is talking about your vision, your point of view, how you see. He's talking about your worldview, how you perceive the world. I want to ask you, man of God, a question. Do you see the world as a positive place or do you see it as a negative place? Because believe me when I tell you this, how you view, view the world will determine how you deal with the world. If your eye is good, your whole world, your whole body, your whole life will be good. But if your eye goes bad, if you have a negative worldview, your whole life will be full of darkness. Now listen to me. That's the basic truth and thought of our society. Society views life as it is what it is. That attitude that says nothing is going to get better. A society that says let the chips fall where they may. A society that says live by chance and hope everything works out. A society that has the attitude that says plan for your marriage to fail. Do you know what a prenup is? It is a pre-failure plan. Well, this marriage might not make it, so let's just set ourselves up. You know what the devil is sitting there saying? Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. I'm going to work on them. I'm going to destroy this marriage. Society says don't waste your time investing spiritual energy in your children because children these days, after all, they're not like we used to be when we were growing up. Just let them do what they want to do. It's useless. And what we've got is a society that has basically written off our young people today and left them to their own devices. That's why preachers stand in the pulpit and tell young people what they think they want to hear rather than what they really need to hear. Instead of speaking the truth in love and correcting them when they are out of order because it's easier to write them off than to challenge them with the truth of God's word, which, by the way, more of them desire the truth than we think. 
Let me tell you the difference in young people today and the days of yesterday. It is not that young people have changed. Listen to me. There are no new mindsets in young people. They didn't just morph into some crazy mindset. The difference is they don't do anything that we didn't try to do or desire to do. We just couldn't get away with it. See, when I decided I was going to do what I wanted to do, my daddy reminded me, boy, I brought you into the world. I'll take you out. Stay with me, men. The problem is that society has changed and we have gone right along with it. We no longer discipline our children because after all, they might call the police and I might end up in jail. I don't care what society says. Listen to me. You are not to run your life and lead your family by the statutes and the governments of society. You are to find out what God says, how God says to do it, and then do it. Do it. Let me put a wrap on this. You're going to have to deal with the cultural influence of the church. Woo now we're going to go somewhere. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unfaithful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I want you to say to yourself, he ain't talking about the sinners. Mm-hmm. Please note how, how, how Paul ends this verse. And from such turn away. Let me tell you something, man of God. If you're going to paint a portrait of what a man of God looks like, let me tell you what I learned a long time ago. There are some people sometimes in the church that you got to turn away from. Uh-huh. This is not simply talking about people who once knew God and walked away. This is not talking about people who walked away from God and the church. This is talking about people who claim to still be with God and they remain in the building week after week who claim to know the power of God, but there is not one shred of evidence in their life to back it up. They don't even put on a good show. They look the part in the building, but outside the building. When they leave the building, they got no power to back it up. Listen to me, anybody can be anointed in the building. Anybody can look holy in the building. And what they miss is this. Now, don't miss this, don't miss this. Not just men, but ladies, listen to me. What we miss when we live this way is that no power, no authority. And many times men, our families are proof of it. The kids won't listen to them because they got no authority. The wife won't submit to them because they got no authority. Co-workers won't listen to them because they don't respect them, and because they don't respect them, they have no authority. And they have no authority. Watch this, watch this, watch this. They have no authority because they have no testimony. Revelation 12 and 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Your testimony speaks. It declares something. And it is this. It declares that the power upon my life is locked up in my testimony. And in your testimony is the power to chase away demonic forces off of your family. But without a holy life, man of God, you lock up the power because the power is in your testimony. See, your talk talks, but your talk walks when your walk walks. Watch me now. One of the main reasons we have so many in the body of Christ who have no testimony is that the culture of the church has changed. Please hear me. The godly men and the worldly men are conspicuously the same. There is no, de line, no distinct line of demarcation between men who don't know God and those who claim to know God. Too many church men, we don't fear God anymore. And let me tell you why. When I was a boy growing up in church, near about every sermon, no matter what they preached on, he ended up talking about hell and holiness in God. And those preachers, man, they would preach those sermons on hell and holiness, and they preach them so much that I would sit in my seat sometime and I go, 
I can feel the flames under my feet. I'm moving my feet up and down. And, and sometimes I would literally, I'm not making sense, I would sleep with one eye open. I'm being like, you know, the devil might invade my room. And, 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 and I don't know about anybody else, but I love breakfast. I love me some bacon and eggs and some rice with butter on it and some, some sugar on top of it. That's a southern thing. And I love me some, a big old glass of milk with some ice in it. I love me some breakfast. And one day I was dreaming about having breakfast. And as I was dreaming, in my dream, the devil was sitting down at the bottom of the stairs. And he was saying, listen to me. No more bacon and eggs for you, little boy. Because they preached on hell and it was so real. Now, we don't need steady diets of sermons on hell and brimfire, but we ought to hear a sermon or two once a year telling us and reminding us that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. But let me tell you what has happened. We have gone the other way so far, telling people that God is loving and God is. He is loving. Believe me when I tell you this. But we have overdosed on his love at the expense of telling people that his love demands and compels him to be a just and righteous God, a holy God. He remembers our frame, that we're dust. And he pities us. You know what that says to me? When we fall, he picks us up. When we're weak, he makes us strong. When we fail, he says, get up and try again. This time it'll work. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. We have, but we have created in the church a culture that no longer reverences a holy God, that no longer believes that he means what he says when he says, be holy, because I'm holy. And therefore, we have lost our power to bring things into divine order in our own lives and in our families. Stay with me. How many times do we have to hear that, yes, God does love you, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. One of the favorite scriptures for dismissing sin is 1 Peter 4 and 8. Watch this now. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of faults. See it. Whenever people use that, they use it to say that real love will help cover up. Don't be a snitch. It is used to hide, to help keep the sin a secret, but that's really not what it says. Let me help you understand what it really says. The phrase shall cover is the Greek word kalupto, which means to unveil, discover, make visible, reveal, while protecting and covering simultaneously. Not for the sake of exposing and making a spectacle, but for the sake of repentance and deliverance and healing. Watch this now. It connects to James 5, 16 through 20. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Watch now. Here's why. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, righteous man, righteous man, righteous man, righteous man, not a saved man, a righteous man availeth much. Watch this now. Elijah was a man with nature like ours. Elijah was just like me. He was tempted. He did some things he shouldn't have done. But watch this. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced the fruit. Listen now. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way he will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Get the correlation here. That's love, covering a multitude of sins, turning you back when you get off track. And when he speaks through this verse, he is speaking to us dads. I will give you what you need. That's love. And then you will give to your family what they need. That's love. Watch this now. I want you to understand that in God loving us, he doesn't always give us what we want, though he does sometimes. But be sure of this. He will always give us what we need. Let me show you and illustrate it for you. If you stumble and fall, God will lavish mercy on you and pick you up because that's love. If you're growing weary and well-doing, God will encourage you because that's love. If your heart is aching, God will pour oil of healing and grace on you because that's love. But listen to me very closely. If you are living out of control and feeding a life of sin without discipline, listen to me. God will pour out discipline on you because that too is love. And he loves us so much that he doesn't want anything to hinder our prayers. Listen, when a member of my family falls ill, I want them to be able to know that my prayers reach heaven. 
When my daughters and my wife are not physically with me and I hear the Holy Spirit prompting me to pray for them, I want to know that I hear his voice clearly. I need to know that when God, as he did in the past, told me to pray for people in this congregation who were getting hit by the COVID and they were being hit by the coronavirus and they were on death's door and I heard the Spirit say, if you don't pray for them, this is unto death. I need to know that I know the voice of God. Listen to me, man of God. If you are going to paint a portrait of a godly man, listen to me, you must resist the temptation of falling into the trap of what has become the culture of many churches and that is to grab a hold of God's wonderful grace while failing to remember that he is a holy and a righteous and a just God. Because the power of your authority is in your testimony. Let me illustrate it this way. The reflection of the sun is supposed to let us see the brilliance of the moon, which has no light of its own. The moon is dark 24-7. The sun reflects off the moon so that the beautiful moon is actually the result of the work of the sun. Now, on some days, we can see a full moon. On other days, we see a half moon. Yet, on other days, only a quarter of the moon is visible, and then at times, we can't see the moon at all. Listen, now, watch this. How is it that we don't always get a full moon? It's because wherever there is less than a full moon, listen now, the earth has gotten in the way. The earth has gotten between a portion of the moon and the sun. The moon's reflection is interrupted as the earth moves in its orbit. Earth simply keeps getting in the way. Hear me. Many of us men are not able to move forward in our lives or in our walk with God because this old earth keeps getting in the way. We are so focused on time and so foggy about eternity that we're missing the benefits of eternity. And they're not able to penetrate the realities of time. And we are stuck with what we see. And I'm going to say it one more time, men. Get this in your spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven, his kingdom, all these things, all the things that that keep you from seeking him, all the things that steal your focus from him, all the things you're pursuing that so occupy your time that you have little time or no time to pursue him. He said, if you seek first the kingdom and my righteousness, he says, I'll make sure everything gets added to you. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Men, when it comes to you, is your light shining? Or does the earth, the things of this world, keep getting in the way. The conclusion of the matter is this. Number one, the church of Jesus Christ must be very, very special to you, man of God. If you're going to leave behind someday the portrait of a godly man, the church of Jesus Christ must be very, very special to you. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 is not a suggestion, is not an option. It is a New Testament, modern day, 21st century command of the King of Glory. That we find ourselves consistently, men, in the house of God with our families. Because in these last days, I am telling you, there will come influences and spirits of delusion that will seek to corrupt and to destroy your family if it is not undergirded, listen to me, by the word and the fellowship of the community of believers of faith. We need one another. When this thing is over... Don't you keep staying at home going, oh, I can just watch on stream. No, you need to stream your little self right back into this house so you can have fellowship with other believers. Number two, the foundation you build for your family is determined by the portrait you paint. Psalm 11 and 3, if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let me talk to you in closing about eternity one more time, man of God. A tombstone contains a date of birth, a date of death, and a dash. Above these things is the name of the deceased, and below usually will be some kind of statement. The most important part of the tombstone is the smallest part, the dash. Tell somebody it's all about the dash. Because the dash is talking about what happened while the person was here on earth. When we meet God, let me tell you something. He is going to discuss the dash. He is going to want to know what we did to serve eternal purposes, and that's all contained in the dash. Let me show you how important you fathers are. 
Listen to Irma Bombeck as she paints a portrait of a little girl who loved her dad but wasn't sure what dads do. One morning, my father didn't get up and go to work. He went to the hospital and died the next day. I hadn't thought much about him before. He was just someone who left and came home and seemed glad to see everyone at night. He opened the jar of pickles when no one else could. He was the only one in the house who wasn't afraid to go into the basement by himself. He cut himself shaving, but no one kissed it or got excited about it. It was understood when it rained, he got the car and brought it around to the door. When anyone was sick, he went out to get the prescription filled. He took lots of pictures, but he was never in them. Whenever I played house, the mother doll had a lot to do. I never knew what to do with the daddy doll, so I just had him say, I'm going off to work now, and I threw him under the bed. The funeral was in our living room, and a lot of people came and brought all kinds of good foods and cakes. We had never had so much company before. I went to my room, and I felt under the bed for the daddy doll. When I found him, I dusted him off and put him on my bed. He never did anything. I didn't know his leaving would hurt so much. Father, I pray for men, and specifically fathers today. Lord, may the single men begin painting the portrait of a godly man before they ever enter into relationship and have family and children. May we who are already there begin or continue to paint the portrait of a godly man. Remind us today that it really is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, blessings, Eagle Heights family, and thank you for joining us this morning. It's now time to worship the Lord as we give God his tithe and our offerings. Amen. If you recently joined us on live stream and this ministry has been a blessing to you, why not sow a seed today and become part of us trying to reach lives for God? Our special offering this Sunday is for the media ministry. We thank God for today's technology, but we also thank God for our media ministry because without them, we wouldn't be able to stream live into your homes. Your special offering will be to support the media ministry and the work that they do. The only way to live under an open heaven is by bringing the tie and the offering to the storehouse, and that storehouse is the church. You know, several days ago, a, a single woman, a, a single mother, she said to me, Pastor Lopez, I got a raise and I got a promotion. And, and, and then she said, and her young daughter who loves to bake cakes is becoming an entrepreneur. And given the season that we're living in, when this mother told me this during that call, it didn't surprise me because she understands the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. And don't you love it when God makes the impossible possible? So it, when we do it God's way, church, we get God's results. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And Father, just as the word goes into our hearts and it never returns void, Father, when we put a seed, it never comes back void either, dear God. And so, Father, we thank you for what you're doing, and we thank you for what you're going to do. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we close, and I speak blessing over you, we've had this covered from the beginning. I want to show you a portrait. This was a portrait that someone had made of me years ago. What's very interesting, and I want you to grab, is this. I was not there when it was painted. It was painted outside of the United States of America. But look at the great resemblance. That's the way, men, we are to reflect the glory and the image of our Father. That when people look at us, there's no guessing. That's him. That's you. You're a man of God. Nobody's guessing. That's the portrait that you and I are to paint. 
So when you can say, as Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Let me talk to you just a few more minutes and we're going to leave. It's not about being perfect, men. But it's about understanding. Know what happened. And God created man in his image and his likeness. Now, don't get offended because I'm going to say something that we don't think about. He said, then he took a rib from the side of man and created woman. Now, watch this. He created both of them, male and female. But pay attention to what I'm about to say, and this is why the devil has had a field day with men. Men, we were the ones created exactly, initially, in the image and the likeness of God, and then God took out of that God-man and created female. The two became one. What does it show? It shows a level of responsibility that rests on men that does not rest on women. In essence, we are the same before God, but not in function. God, I hope we're grabbing this in our spirits because the society is messed up because men we got to rise up now. We got to say, the devil's not having one more conversation with Eve. You're going to have to come to me. You're going to have to go through me. You're not talking to Eve anymore. You're talking to me. Amen. Stand with me. Bless your family. Lift your hands now in the presence of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been a blessing to worship with you again this Sunday. You can continue to watch us online and stream with us, or you can join us for an in-person service at 8.30, 10.15, or 12 p.m. You can register online at ehconline.org. We look forward to seeing you next week when Bishop Collins brings us a new powerful message entitled One Nation Under Deceit. Be blessed this week, church.